here on Twitch on the live coding with Matt Groves stream. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. This is episode 58. We're going to do some digital challenge updates today. If you're not familiar, that's a ASP.NET Core web application that I use when I, uh, well, most, most of the time when I'm at an event uh, representing Couchbase at the booth. I run a digital challenge which allows people to win some cool prizes and have a little fun along the way. So uh, when I get some time, I like to make some uh, improvements, some fixes, some updates to this, uh, just to make sure it's, uh, it keeps improving. So we're going to work on that today. So that should be lots of fun. We got unit tests, we got new features, we got all kinds of cool stuff coming up. All right, so let's get on with the normal intro here. If you're hanging out in the chat there, if you're watching this on YouTube, the only stupid question is the one you do not ask. So that is to say, ask the question. If you think of a question, uh, don't be afraid to ask it. Even if it's off topic, even if it's, you know, even if you think it's, uh, you know, a noob question and you don't want to look like a noob, this is a noob friendly channel. Uh, you know, we do some relatively intermediate to advanced stuff here, but this is a noob friendly channel. And I don't even like using the word noob because it's kind of like a little bit of a slur. So this is a, a channel that is friendly to those who have questions, all right? And uh, it's not only noobs that have questions. So anybody has a question, ask away. I'll do my normal plugs here. I'm on Team Live Coders. This is a Twitch team. Twitch slash team slash live coders. And you can see a list of people who are live coding right now from our team. We've got a lot of new faces on there uh, this time slot. So we'll come back to this at the end of the stream and we'll raid one of these people here if they're still streaming or we'll find someone else who's doing some coding and we will raid them. But if you're looking for someone, some people to follow, if you're getting into live coding for the first time, if you want to check it out, uh, live coding on Twitch, this is a great place to go. Twitch slash team slash live coders. Check it out. And if you're looking for a wider list of people to draw from, let's say you already follow everybody on team live coders, which you should, you can also go to awesome developer streams. This is a repo here on GitHub, GitHub slash BNB slash awesome developer streams. This is a huge list of people who are streaming, what they're streaming about, and where they're streaming. It's not just Twitch. It's not just the Live Coders team. It's anyone who's live coding uh, in some fashion, whether it's Mixer or YouTube or whatever. Uh, you'll find people here, and you can just do a Control F from your browser and search for something. Let's say you're interested in game dev. Well, there we go. Jack Mott's doing game dev. Jonathan Blow's doing game dev etc. So another great place to start, github slash bnb slash awesome developer streams. You can watch my old videos. Uh, you know, as this is a live right now, this is live video if you're watching right now on Twitch, but I also, uh, when they get saved to Twitch, I also save them over to YouTube. And I may have forgotten to do the last one, but I'll eventually get to it. They get saved over to YouTube in perpetuity. You can uh, leave questions and comments there. I will get notified of all those and I will uh, answer them or address them here on the next episode. So if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead, leave a message there. Don't be shy. Again, this is a uh, in friendly to questions, friendly to everybody channel. Okay, some more plugs. There is a yet another couch-based course published on Pluralsight by the same author, Kishan Ayer. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And this one is about modifying data in Couchbase using Nickel. So at this point, it's, he's got a pretty big suite of Nickel-related courses. So we got filter data. This is the original one. Query data. Uh, I'm, you know, I haven't watched this one. I'm not quite sure the difference between these two, but um, you know, we could definitely look into that. Combine and aggregate data. That's very important. Oftentimes, lots of performance gotchas there. So definitely want to check that out. Great Couchbase function, not strictly related to Nickel. That's more like a, like a trigger event sort of thing. Not really a trigger, but uh, kind of like that. And modified data in Couchbase using Nickel. So update, delete, insert, I assume are the ones there, merge, all those sorts of things will be covered in that course. So you've got a lot of stuff to do here. Um, and uh, I'm working on uh, at least one course right now for Couchbase as well. And that will be, the deadline for that is May, I believe, early May. So we'll look for it then. In the meantime, you can check out these courses by Keyshawn a year and uh, check those out on Plural Site. And we just launched this this morning. I just launched this this very morning. Uh, I, won't, I won't go to it here, but if you are a developer 
and you use Couchbase or you have used Couchbase in the past, especially the SDK, so if you're doing Java, .NET, um, Node, PHP, Ruby, things like that, if you've used those, this is a survey about the documentation for the newer versions of the SDK. So there's been a major uh, update to all the SDKs. So if they were 2.0, they're now 3.0. If they were 1.0, they're now 2.0. And some pretty significant changes along with that. And that's, that's, that's one thing. But the thing this survey is about is the new documentation uh, for the, these SDKs. And this is just the starting point, actually. So if you go to the survey, fill all these questions, and you're going to get entered to win some cool prizes, some very cool prizes. I, I helped uh, pick them out, so some very cool stuff there. Um, you're entered to win one of those. We've done that before. But this is unique because there's an opportunity here for you to opt into a kind of a, a program where you're going to spend uh, like an hour-ish with a live interaction with a Couchbase employee, probably someone from the documentation team. And it'll be like a kind of a user test, like a user study. And they're going to uh, interact with you and observe your actions and, and try to figure out, you know, what are some of the things that people are getting tripped up on the documentation? What are some things we can improve? What are some things that are missing? Things like that. And that live interaction comes with a guaranteed reward, uh, a, a very large gift card amount. So if you're interested in that, take the survey and then opt in to, hey, I want to do the live interaction as well. Now, again, I want to stress this is only this is only meant for developers who currently use or have used in the past Couchbase. If you've never used the Couchbase SDK, uh, you know, you're welcome to take the survey, but I'm guessing a lot of the questions, a lot of the answers, you're not going to have really good answers for. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like you have to log in or anything. It's open to the public, but uh, it, is, it is meant for that kind of audience. So if that's you or you know somebody that works with Couchbase, send them the survey and... Uh, Let's get going. This is open until the end of March, and there's some very cool prizes, like I said. I'm starting to get the hang of this uh, prizes thing, I think, I think. Um, yeah, okay. Next, upcoming events. You, well, fingers crossed here, because uh, events are getting canceled left and right this month due to the whatever this uh, coronavirus is called, the uh, Wuhan COVID-19 coronavirus, whatever. Events are going to cancel. Microsoft canceled the MVP Summit, which is a real bummer. Looking forward to that. Uh, it's not canceled. I shouldn't say that. It's, it's, been, it's been turned into a virtual-only event. And Twilio just announced they are canceling their events and pulling out their sponsorship from uh, many events, which seems like a tough one to do. But uh, they just announced that. So, so, hey, thank you for the follow. Sam J 4011 Thank you for joining us. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, so these events coming up are tenuous, especially the March ones. But SQL Saturday Cincinnati. If you're in the Cincinnati, Ohio-ish area, Kentucky, Indiana, Naren Dev. Hi, Naren Dev. Thanks for stopping in. Good to see you. If you're in that area, definitely check out SQL Saturday. It's a very, I think, very inexpensive or potentially even free event. Don't quote me on that. Uh, lots of cool SQL professionals there. It's not really exclusively SQL, like Microsoft SQL Server. There's a lot of people who just work with data there. And I will be speaking there. I will not be speaking on SQL Server. I'll be speaking on, um, on uh, well, NoSQL, actually. This is a sort of a intro to NoSQL session that they've selected. And I'm looking forward to this very much. So if you're in the area, March 21st, it's a Saturday. Come check it out. Orlando Code Camp. Again, fingers crossed. It's not, uh, it's not canceled or postponed. March 28th in Orlando. So if you're in the Florida area or uh, you just want to go to Orlando, uh, you're from India. So there will there be a stream of those events? Uh, SQL Saturday, I don't think so. This is a very low cost, like community run event. I don't think they can afford live streams. Orlando Code Camp, I don't know. Uh, it's possible. But again, it's Code Camp. It's very community driven. It's very low budget, um, volunteer. So I doubt they can afford that sort of thing. Um, Microsoft Ignite, the tour, uh, that's a different story, right? But I, I won't be speaking at that event. There will be lots of great sessions and, and things, and uh, I don't know if those will be online or not. Those may be online only for people who attended or something like that. But I'll be there. And then Codestock, 
I don't know about Code Stock either. That's a really good Bing question. Thank you for the follow in there, and Dev. Appreciate it. Thanks for dropping in and uh, participating. Really appreciate it. So this is the point I was making earlier. Just ask a question, and uh, it's a comfortable place to ask a question. So don't don't be afraid to whatever's on your mind. Just throw it in the chat room there, as long as it's you know not inappropriate. And then other events coming up, uh, those are later on. We'll talk about those as we go. But uh, SQL Saturday, Orlando Code Camp, check those out for sure. And check out those websites. Just do a quick Google form, and you'll see the websites. See if they offer any sort of online content or uh, how that works. All right. Okay, so let's get on with it today. Crack the knuckles here. Not really doing anything. We're going to work on the Digital Challenge website today. So uh, this is the things that I want to cover. Uh, FYI, my name is just Naren. Okay, that's cool. I'll just call you Naren from now on. I assume the dev is short for developer. Naren, the developer. Uh, hopefully I'm saying it right. Naren, Naren, Naren. Uh, something like that. But uh, yes, uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for that. Okay, so these are the things I want to cover. This is kind of like a little bit of backlog. It's not really like an official backlog, because I this is sort of floating around in my mind. But uh, uh, oh, let's see, I added dev, short form for dev, to my name for the username. Yeah, makes sense? Makes sense. Okay, so uh, some things that I noticed. I opened up the project this morning, and I noticed that I broke some unit tests. They won't actually compile. So the last time I shipped, I, I must have not compiled the unit test project because I would have caught these. But uh, yeah, I made some, the third pronunciation is accurate. Let's see. Naren is what I've been saying, so that's wrong. Naren. Uh, Naren. Naren? Is that the one? Naren? Anywho, I, I think there's a little lag there, uh, Naren, so uh, sorry about that. Um, or I'm a little lagged, one or the other. So I gotta fix some unit tests. Those gotta be done first uh, because it won't even compile. So we need to fix those. I commented them out for now just to get it to compile, just to make sure uh, I had the configuration stuff set up. But I gotta do that. And then I'm gonna check all of them because I may have made other changes that didn't break the compilation but may have broken the tests or may have broken the code itself. So we gotta check all of those. And we're gonna, as we go, add more unit tests today. Yes, pretty close, okay. <laughs> the third one. Okay. All right, and then, uh, so once I get those in place, I wanna go look at the back end. So a couple problems I've had, and this, these are all been back end issues, so they're not issues that appear to uh, the, most of the people who come to the booth and, and use the digital challenge. Uh, the tech stack in today's stream, ASP.NET Core, um, we're going to be using ASP.NET Core, uh, not much in the way of JavaScript. Like there's not, not much uh, in the front end, in the browser. Uh, I don't know if there's any, actually. There's some for Bootstrap, I think. And Couchbase, of course, as the NoSQL database on the back end. And we're, just, and we're using you know, some libraries like uh, OAuth uh, extensions and uh, Couchbase extensions and um, NUnit for the unit tests because uh, I love end units. So that's the stuff we'll be working with today. I don't know if we'll get into much Couchbase today. We might, but it'll mostly be ASP.NET Core and some end unit, some C Sharp. Okay, and uh, Visual Studio, of course. All right, uh, so these are some issues that's been kind of bothering me a little bit as someone who has to work with this app on the back end and, and figure out winners and figure out uh, you know who signed up, things like that. Uh, and so, uh, and actually to create the quizzes. So right now, ordering the questions is completely manual and kind of prone to messing things up, right? I just have to give each question a number and hopefully I get the numbers right. That has to be unique, all those sorts of things. So I wanna see if I can make that a little easier. The second thing is searching ASP.NET Core. Yes, that's correct, ASP.NET Core. Uh, are you not familiar with ASP.NET? Have you not heard of it before? It's, uh, it's uh, Microsoft's, mm, excuse me, web framework that runs on .NET Core. And uh, we'll see a little bit of it today. Um, but yes, ASP.NET Core. And so the other thing is, I've got quite a database of people, which we, you won't see today. I'm not gonna show you the actual database, but uh, 
it's quite a bit of people. So if I want to go through and I want to search for some details about people, I have to sort of keep clicking through in alphabetical order, page, 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 and to find them. So I'd much rather have a search feature that I could just search for, oh, type in Matt, and it'll give me everybody who has Matt in their name, that sort of thing. So I'm not sure if I want to use a, a SQL query for this or I want to use a full text search. We'll see how it goes. The other thing I want to think about, and this is more the, for the front end, is that this isn't a huge issue, but it's been kind of bothering me a little bit where people go in and they answer, ask a question or answer a question and they get it right and they're not sure what to do next. And so what I have, what I tell them to do in person is uh, go back to the nav page and go to the next question. But what I'd like to do is to improve that experience. Sorry, yes, I, I have heard of it, but not familiar with it. Okay. What kind of uh, tech stacks do you usually work with there? What kind of code do you usually write? Because if uh, maybe I can do some comparison for you to kind of uh, kind of keep us on the same page. But I want to I want to figure out uh, what what do I want to do to improve that flow. I'm not sure what that is yet, but I'm going to think about it. Your tech stack is JavaScript, Dart, and GoLang. Interesting. The JavaScript and Dart and Go. And well, what kind of uh, databases do you usually work with? Got a phone call. That was weird. Um, yeah, what, what sort of database do you usually work with? Because uh, uh, I'm guessing JavaScript for the front end, maybe Dart for the front end, uh, and then Golang for the back end. There must be a database in there somewhere and some sort of framework, I assume. Unless you're not doing web development. I don't know. Um, and leaderboard. So this is kind of a minor little thing, but there's a leaderboard at these events, and... You know, you can see the leaderboard on your own device as you're walking around the conference. And uh, it would be nice if it could highlight where you are in the leaderboard. Like if you're in the top 10, just bold your name. Or if you're not in the top 10, just sort of show like, oh, this is what place you're in. So we'll see if we can. And that's going to that's gonna have to involve a modifying our SQL query. So, all right, let's get over to it. MongoDB, you say, you're used to it. Ah, oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. That's a, that's a Couchbase competitor there. So maybe you'll see today why you should uh, check out uh, Couchbase uh, for your next project. Yeah, there's, there is something of a lag. I assume since you're in India, that's a big part of it. I'm in, uh, I'm in Ohio in the United States. So there's a bit of a lag there. And of course, there's always a lag involved in streaming video. I think there might be a button for you, uh, Naren, somewhere around here to turn on the high, uh, like the lower latency option. I'm not sure what the trade-off is there, but you might want to try one of these settings down here at the, in the video controls. Okay, let me just review what this app does here first. All right, so normally a developer would come to, they would come to our booth at Couchbase um, and they would uh, scan a QR code or enter a URL and it would take them to a screen like this and they would type in a, um, I think that's right. They would type in a, well, no, I think it was this. They type in an invite code. It probably would be pre-filled for them, actually. I, I would just give them a, 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 a URL like this. So it would be pre-filled. They would hit submit, and they'd be taken to this screen here. Now, keep in mind, most people are using this on a smaller device at events. They're using it on a phone. Uh, so it's probably going to be more like this. All right. So this TBD would be a big, it'd be a lot more text, right? It would be the rules of the, of the game, what the prizes are, what, you know, uh, explain how it works, things like that. And this toggle actions would bring up the menu. And then they would go to the first question and be presented with, in this case, a multiple choice. So what kind of NoSQL database is Couchbase? It's a document database. And they hit submit and get feedback on it. If they got the wrong answer, it's not relational, it would say sorry. And you can keep answering the question until you get it right. And of course, the trick there is um, you get if you keep just guessing and getting it wrong, you're going to get penalized by uh, some amount of points. You're not going to get the full amount of the quiz. So then, so then uh, you would go on. This is the part where I'm talking about. If I get it right on your phone, it's not really clear. Like, how do I go to the next question? Right. So you got to go here and then go to. Uh, so the thing is. You know, in my mind, you don't have to answer these in order. You can skip around if you want to. Um, but uh, most people are just going to go in order. I think that's what I found. So I want to make both things possible. So I'm thinking perhaps another button here that says submit and go to next. That might, uh, that might be helpful. 
And if it's wrong, of course, it won't go to next. It'll just come back to the existing page. So anyway, we'll, th we'll think about that. But let's, uh, let's go to the unit test here and see what's, uh, what's broken. So I've got some, uh, let's see. Let's see what we got here. So JavaScript for React.js, Node.js Dart for Flutter. Oh, okay, so you're doing like mobile apps. You're writing mobile apps then. All right. I think uh, you should definitely check out uh, Couchbase if you're doing a lot of mobile applications. You just you learned Go a few days ago. And so Couchbase has a very cool mobile, uh, s mobile synchronization feature. Uh, so it's a, it's a database that will uh, live on your uh, device, on your iOS or Android device. You can read and write to it offline or online. And then it'll automatically sync to, um, to your data center if you have connection, right? So if you're in a situation where you don't have connection, it'll still read and write to the database. But when there is connection, it will then sync the data over. You've always turned on low latency. Well, it's, it was worth a try. Uh, I'm, for, for what it's worth, on my end, I'm not seeing any sort of uh, lag problems or drop frames or anything. So it's just probably an issue of, uh, you know, we're on opposite sides of the world. So. And them's the breaks, as they say. Anywho, uh, all right. So what I've got here is I've got a series of tests, and these are testing the home controller. Oh, you're now learning gRPC for the Golang and Node.js. Yeah, I haven't done any gRPC at all. Maybe that's something I should... Should tackle at some point um, to get the basics about it down. So we're testing the home controller, and uh, this is only this is just testing the whole home controller here. So if we look at tests, here's the breakdown of my project. I've got the core, which does um, data access and some business logic and things like that. I've got uh, UI, which is the ASP.NET project. And I've got test, which is a unit test project. So I've got home controller. So if we go look at home controller, and I don't know what this corresponds to in your dev stack, but it's the MVC pattern, basically is what it's doing. So we have a controller, and then each of these actions corresponds roughly to an endpoint. So I've got uh, two endpoints basically here, index and invite code endpoint. This, this are, these are kind of the same endpoint but it's two different ways, like one's a post and one is a, a, a get. They both, I mean, and the, I say they're endpoints, but they're really, they, they return views, right? So they're returning HTML. So I'm not using any sort of JavaScript front end. I'm not providing a JSON, um, a JSON um, API, if you will. Is this Visual Studio IDE? That's correct, this is Visual Studio. Uh, the latest version, Visual Studio 2019, version 16.4.5. This is the absolute latest, and this is the enterprise version of it. There is a free version, I believe, Visual Studio Community. There are some features missing from that. And there's also, of course, Visual Studio Code, which is totally free and cross-platform. It would be a tool you could use for JavaScript, Dart, and Golang, for instance. Uh, React. Uh, node and uh, so on. I'm not sure about Flutter. Flutter uh, might be, I've never done Flutter, so it might not be a good fit for Visual Studio Code. I don't know. So anyway, let's look at these tests here. So I've got uh, index should get the home view. So I just want to verify that, uh, get the home view. What is, all oh, right. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm running this uh, get home view method. You said, wow. You're saying wow about. So this is just verifying that we're calling that get home view method. That's all this is doing. That should probably still be passing. Uh, and then next we're gonna say logged in username should be used to get the home view. So if the user is logged in, right, this will return something. Uh, and then we're just making sure that we're passing it. You're always on the VS code. Oh yeah, VS code plus flutter is a killer combo. Okay, good to know, yeah. Yeah, VS Code is a, I use VS Code for pretty much everything except for uh, when I'm doing ASP.NET C Sharp. I still use I still use it for that. I use VS Code for everything else, and I will, from time to time, use Writer from JetBrains. Um, so, th I just use sort of whatever uh, you know. Uh, I've used Writer with other projects before. I've always used Visual Studio with this project, but. Um, Writer is also cross-platform, so I might want to check that one out too. 
Visual Studio, this one is not cross-platform. This is Windows only up here. Yeah, the Enterprise Edition. So I'm, I am a Microsoft MVP, and so they give, us, uh, they give us licenses for pretty much everything, including Visual Studio Enterprise. Yeah. But the MVP Summit, the event the MVPs go to, it was, it was uh, not canceled, but it was uh, the in-person version of it is, has been canceled. But yeah, this is one of the perks of being an MVP is I get to use, uh, you know, they give me licenses for, for all this uh, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so these are the tests down here that were broken in the by the compiler. So let's just run, I'm using ReSharper here to run the tests, my favorite uh, uh, Visual Studio extension. And you can see here that those tests pass. I don't know why that, would, that window came over there, but those tests pass. And so now let's look at this one and let's see what happened here. So the default form is passed to the invite code page. So this is what happens if um, if uh, no invite code is, is presented. You just saw the discussion on Twitter about the MVP summit, I assume. Yep. Hashtag MVP buzz. Hashtag MVP summit. So this is testing the case, and this is broken because this is a feature I added uh, relatively recently and just didn't get around to unit testing it. Um, if we go here to the invite code, notice the URL has no nothing specified up there. So this is giving us the default page. So this would be if the user had to type in the invite code manually, which, you know, I've, I've kind of moved away from that at the events, kind of trying to make it easier, but it's still a possibility. So we want to test the case where nothing is being passed in. Null as string, is that right? Yes. Okay. And possible null reference exception. Interesting. So uh, we want to, uh, the case here where, uh, yeah, we're doing invite code. So from query, so this is going to be null. And so we want to make sure that this test still passes, that it's still returning a model, but it's going to be a, a, a default string here. Well, can I just do default string? It's the same thing, null as string or default string, because the default value of string is null in, in C Sharp. Okay, that's passing. Okay, the next one is down here. If the invited zone is not added to user, show an error message. So why would that why would that happen? So yeah, if there's no zone found or yes, about the MVP so I'm gonna follow you on Twitter now. I'm actually learning web and app development, full stack developing my first tech job. Oh, mostly hoping for a remote job. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at mgroves, twitter.com slash mgroves. Definitely appreciate the follow. I have been working remote myself for um, a long time, 10, 10 years, more than 10 years. I think I had my first remote job in 2009, something like that. So I've been working remote a long time. So I love, I love remote, absolutely. Uh, getting your first, your first job as a remote job, we've discussed this in the past on previous streams, that, that's gonna be uh, challenging. You gotta find the right company there um, that, that's willing to take a chance on it. Well, this person doesn't have any, uh, developer, doesn't have any remote experience or developer experience. Uh, can, you know, can we effectively coach them remotely? So, I mean, there's companies out there that do that. Uh, but it's just, that's just going to be, uh, you know, a little harder to find. So I wish you luck in that. Um, I, I do think remote work is extremely, um, yeah, it is a decade. Uh, I'm, I'm an old man. Uh, I think remote work is extremely important, and it's uh, a, a something that software companies should take more seriously and do more of. There's so many so many benefits to it. Uh, there's a book, in fact, if I can recommend a book, if we could go off on a little bit of a tangent here. Remote, no office needed, no office required. This is an English book, I believe. I don't know if they have any other translations available. But check this out, Remote Office Not Required. This is a book by Jason Freed and DHH. 
They are the founders of 37 Signals, aka Basecamp. And this is a great book. It's relatively short. Um, I don't know if there's a page, number of pages here. Yeah, 256. Wow, 256. That does not seem... I don't remember it being that big. <laughs> Let me see. I might, I might have it over there in the bookshelf. We'll be right back. No, I, I don't have it here. I may have given it to somebody else. But anyway, great book um, for people who want to be remote employees and for uh, people who are, you know, maybe on the fence thinking about, you know, what's this remote thing all about? Is this worth, is this worth the trouble or worth the hassle? Can I really, uh, you know, can I really trust people who are working uh, at, at their own, at their own uh, office? So this book is full of uh, information about that from, from two guys who have run a remote-only company for a long, long time. These are the guys, uh, DHH is the, the original inventor, I guess you could say, of uh, Ruby on Rails. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely worth reading. Now, they have lots of interesting business philosophies that maybe don't pe people don't agree with, but... This remote book, I think, is just chock full of great information. So, highly recommend it. Definitely check out that book. Definitely worthwhile reading. Okay. Now back to our unit test. So we want to, we want to. Yeah, I highly recommend. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm glad. And, and let me know what you think. Uh, if you got the book, read a little bit of it. Come, come back and uh, let me know what you think about it. Uh, they have, they have some other books as well that are really good. Um, but uh, that's that's probably my favorite one. So yeah, but you know the thing was, I my first remote job was not my first software development job. I I had done uh, two other full time positions as a developer that were you know me going into an office for six seven years something like that before I jumped into remote work. And I was very skeptical of remote work going in like oh this isn't this isn't going to work this isn't going to work out. Uh, but I turned out I loved it, so and I'm, that's what I've done since then. Now I'm doing a lot more travel, in person, type of stuff. But most of the time I'm at home here in the office working. Okay, so we are testing to see if the invited zone is not added. Show the user message for whatever reason it's not added. It doesn't exist, or it's been closed, or excuse me, hasn't been opened yet. And so uh, we want to test that add zone to user returns false. It's not returning false anymore. Now it's returning a zone ID. So, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Doug Decoder. Thanks for joining us, but uh, the Twitch bot is down. I, I forgot to mention this early on. Twitch bot's still broken. Still can't get it to work locally. I'm going to have to do some minor re-architecting to get that to deploy it into production because I don't want to run it on my desktop machine again. That was always such an annoyance to do that. But my current project is not open source, I don't think. Um, so I can't give you a link, but it's the Couchbase Digital Challenge. Uh, when I say open source, I mean, I don't think I have a public repo for it available yet. I, I, I plan on it eventually. Um, but thanks for stopping by and saying hi. All right, so uh, this returns, let me just... Go back in here. So this, this, I think I remember changing this. It used to return true or false. You'll eventually attempt to write a Twitch bot. Well, of course, anyone who's on, uh, who's doing live coding, has to write a Twitch bot at some point. Okay. So it's going to get the zone by the code. If the zone is null, return null. Okay. So I expect this to return null. And this get invite by code is running some SQL. Um, as long as it hasn't expired yet. <clears throat> Okay, so I think that's fine. I'm not super happy with that logic, but uh, basically what it means is we're going to return, again, default string. Because the zone ID is a string. It's not a number. It's a string. Okay, so I just want to make sure that these error messages are actually uh, being 
generated correctly, and it looks like we're passing. Okay. Last one. If the invited zone is added, go back to the home page. Okay. So in this case, we want to return an actual zone, and it doesn't matter what it is. Some zone ID doesn't matter. And then we expect to see a redirect to action result. And this is giving a little bit of uh, swiggles because um, that could be a null reference exception. But that would be okay in a unit test. That would make the unit test fail. And that would be fine. Okay. And boom. Okay. Got it. So it says back to the home page, but I don't think I want it to go back to the home page. That's actually not correct. Oh, have, have a good dinner. We'll see you later. Thanks for coming by. Okay, so this is, this is, something's wrong here. I'm trying to some ID, okay. So there's, there's a view. Yeah, okay, index is the controller. Is no, is the, yeah, we wanna to go to the zone. Yeah, okay, so this is this is not a complete test. I want to, I want to go to the uh, controller name is equal to zone. I want to make sure, because I don't want to go just to any old index. I want to go to the zone index. Because at this point, they've entered the invite code, and let's get them into the zone. Let's run this test. This is just sort of a, a little reminder that just because a test is green doesn't mean it's actually, uh, doesn't actually prove anything. So that's why it's important to make these as readable as possible. Uh, not that I'm doing a great job at that, but uh, it's important to, to make your unit test readable. Okay, so those, those are tests are all compiling now, and they're all passing. So now I want to run all the tests. So let's open up um, ReSharper and unit test and unit test. Yes, right here. Unit test explorer. That's what I want. It should always be over here. And I reinstalled Visual Studio recently. That's why it's showing up like that. Let's run all the tests. Okay, integration test failed, which uh, I would expect to, maybe. Uh, this fake data one, um, that's just, that's not really a test. It's just when I want some test data, which I forgot about actually. That's kind of cool. Um, so what else, what else failed? Integration test. Skip when live unit testing. Yeah, yeah. When SQL is correct, action is marked completed in the system for user. Even when JSON formatting isn't. A, what is this test? When JSON. Oh yeah, JSON is an exact match. Yeah. Okay. So why is this failing? This should be passing. I think bucket provider, where does that come from? We've got a fake bucket provider. Analytics service, okay. The fake bucket provider is still connecting. So what is the, why is this failing? Oh, shoot, I lost it. It's an integration test. I don't want it to run every single time. I should probably, well, I don't know. I don't want it to run during live unit testing, which is what this category is for. I don't have live unit testing on. But why is this failing? Do I not have, I bet I know what it is. This uses analytics. I don't have anything for analytics. Okay, that's what the problem is. So I need to have, I do have the travel sample. So we're going to create data set travel on, oh, gotta sneeze. Gosh, sorry about that. That's why uh, the travel ban going on right now because people are just sneezing everywhere. Oh, I already do have travel. Okay. Um, so what is the problem here? Let's run this query. Okay, it returns stuff. Uh, 
Yeah, so what's the problem? I guess we'll have to step through it. Oh, not that one. Wrong button. Nope, oh, stop. Stop. This one. Debug. Okay. So username. So that is what the answer is. So I'm setting up like a fake question here. Uh, and that's the query that the person would enter. There, there's a, a class of questions on this digital challenge that requires the person to actually write SQL. Um, and then I'm running it against the check answer. So I'll just go into that. Okay, this is returning everything, fine. This is the actual check answer function. So this is kind of what, we're, what I'm testing with a real database. Okay, did SQL fail? No, it didn't fail. Did the answer match? It says the answer didn't match. Interesting. So it's like the JSON results aren't matching. Huh, this was, a, this was something I had to figure out um, some time ago. a way to compare two JSON strings to see if they are basically equivalent um, by, by parsing them, right? So why don't I just... Uh, let's, just uh, let's just take these and do it manually and see if it's actually something... Uh, that I can do anything, do something about, or if it's maybe something in the JSON library uh, changed. So what I'm going to use for this is uh, I might start JSON lint because this can format stuff for me. So we'll validate JSON. And we'll do uh, another one here. Let's put this one over here and this one over here. And we'll take this one. I'm just going to do a visual compare here. Twenty-four, twenty-two, wait, two, twenty-four, twenty-two, twenty-eight, thirty-four, three forty. Yeah, these look. Oh no, no, something's something's not right. JS Beautifier also works. Wonder if Notepad Plus Plus has a JSON formatting plugin native capability. Uh, it mm, it might be a plugin. What I really want is a JSON diff, if there's something like a JSON diff um, to do that. But wow, I think I'm seeing the problem here. This is returning a whole bunch of results. This is only returning a, a few. It makes me wonder why this test ever worked. Um, because I think what I do, let me just double check this. Check the answer is, we'll go in here, at some point, yeah, I, I cut off if there's more than 10 results. So what I don't want to happen is people to run uh, queries that, you know, return all 32,000 travel documents. I don't want that because that, I mean, it's going to be a, a big enough load on the actual analytics service if enough people are doing this. But it's also going to be an even bigger load to, to transfer that 32,000 from the server to the ASP.NET app. So I cut it off at 10. Note plus plus, Notepad plus plus does have a compare plugin, which won't format the JSON, but will highlight differences. Right, right. Um, but I'm curious why. Hmm. Hey, hey, Harui, what's going on? Thanks for stopping by. Good to see you again. Uh, okay, so this is the actual expected JSON that I pass in. Which I think that may be the problem. Oh, oh gosh, it's escaped. But uh, anyway, I think it's just too... well. 
Just got home from school, got messed up with X unit today. Sorry about that. I, I can't remember if we talked about this before, but I, I'm an N unit guy for sure, N unit for life. And I don't remember if you agreed with me and you didn't didn't like X unit or you just like X unit instead. I can't remember. Yeah, this is this is returning too many results. I think that's my ex my expected value here is wrong. So this is what I should be expecting. I think. I guess maybe the problem. I haven't talked about that yet. I've talked about it with somebody. Which must must not have been you. Action.answers equals okay, and we're gonna paste this in here. And JetBrains is going to escape it for us. Thank you, JetBrains. Uh, oh, yeah, it's got to be in a list. New list of string. Okay, let's see if that does a trick. Okay, so it's just I had uh, the wrong, see, confused because it should never have. Uh, passed. But one of the things I wanted to test with this is white space. Because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want this to fail um, if the JSON formatting is slightly different. Why do I prefer any units? Well, I don't really have a good reason. Um, it's just what I've worked with, what I'm most used to. And uh, the one thing with X unit, there's no setup. With X unit, it's just like a different pattern, and so I've just kind of gotten used to the whole idea of setup um, in my in my tests of fixtures. Not that there's nothing wrong with anything X units approach. It's a it's a, I think it's a valid opinion, but uh, it's like X unit. And so actually, technically speaking, I think my favorite test unit testing framework is um, M spec, but no one uses M spec, unfortunately. Uh, so whenever I tried to introduce mspec, the rest of the team would be like, what is this? I don't know how to do this. Let's just go back to end unit. But I, most of my, most of my testing, uh, most of my tests in my career have been end unit. Just what I'm used to. Okay, so I got this test working. JSON diff. I'm always a little leery of online tools like this, but at a casual glance it looks okay. So why are you leery of online tools? That's curious. All right, so I'm going to try it out. There's that one, and there's this one. Compare. Okay. Okay. Well, that that would uh, that's pretty good. That's uh, that's exactly what I want. And it even uh, prettys it up for me. Tools where you may be pasting production code or data. Yikes. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, no, that makes sense. This this is this data is not sensitive in the least, so I don't have any reservations about that. But yes, that's fair. That's a fair uh, concern. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wouldn't put paste anything uh, that you're worried about other people seeing into any web page, JSON or not. So yes, that's a that's a fair point. It's good to be it's good to be suspicious. Uh, but yeah, this is not exactly what I expect to see, but it's pretty darn close. And uh, what is this? 50 missing properties. Yeah, uh, that's good. Yeah, it seems good. <laughs> so cool. Thank you very much for that. JSONDiff.com. We got the test passing. You know what that means? It's time for commit. Okay, so, and again... I get criticized for this sometimes, but I like the UI tools for Git. Okay, fixed unit tests that weren't compiling. Uh, I'll keep this integration one separate. So I just fixed unit tests and we're compiling due to feature change. Tech debt, basically, is what I did there. Commit that, and we'll commit the other one separately. 
Okay, uh, fixed integration test with uh, SQL plus plus eval. How was this? How was this even working in the first place? What I just changed is I just changed the expected answer, and there we go. Okay, so. Unit test done. Let's go work on something else. Uh, go back to my intro here. All right, so we uh, did this. And I've checked all of them. Yep, and we're gonna add more today as we go. So for the back end, we've got these two things. We got make it easier to order questions and we wanna be able to search names. So why don't I just show you what this looks like. So I go to admin here, which is, this is typically not something that most users see, but if I go to zones, I go to actions, you can see here I've got these nine questions and I've got them in a specific order. So if I want to change the order, well, let's say I want to add another question here. I want to add Couchbase Basics 4. I want it to be the fourth question, right? So Couchbase Basics 4 and um, uh, where, uh, name a website where I can diff JSON. So I would say, oh, let's put that in the fourth one. I'll give it 10 points and the fill in the blank would be, uh, uh, fill in the blank, jsondiff.com and uh, there we go. Okay, you see the problem here. I've got two questions that are four and this will be even worse if I go to the actual quiz. You can see here we've got four and four because they both have the same order number, they both, you know, I can't go to the second one. I only do the first one. So that's a real problem. It's a pain in the neck because I have to then go through and renumber the rest of these, which in this case doesn't look like it'd be too bad. I got to renumber this, got to renumber this, got to renumber this, renumber this, etc. And then it's a second problem because that, that causes a bug on the front end if I happen to order them wrong. So, I uh, gotta figure out a way, and we'll remove this one, to when I'm creating actions or editing actions to figure out a way to reorder the numbers. So how do we do that? Now, this is something I did, I remember we came up with a solution for this a long, long time ago. One of my, my first web developer positions, we had a similar situation where I had an ordered list of, of things renumber the largest number first. Renumber the largest number first. So I wanna, I wanna do this in kind of an automated way, right? So if I wanna go in here and add, um, let me just fix these. Five, six, seven, and eight. You can see that's kind of a pain there. So if I wanna, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Bold bearded biller, builder, hello, hola to you, what's going on? We're doing some ASP.NET Core today, working on the, um, the digital challenge app that I use at events when I'm at the booth. This is a way for developers to come to our booth and take a challenge, which is some questions and maybe a little bit of code writing, some tech stuff. And the people who have the most points at the end of the event they win prizes. You can also see we got a, I got a bug here. This isn't actually showing the zone name. It's just a placeholder. Not a big deal. ASP Net Core, you're speaking my love language. Okay. That's a little weird, dude. But uh, yeah, to each their own. Uh, so I'm going to just mark this down on my list here. This is not a big deal because, again, this is only something that generally I see or other people at the booth, other couch-based staff see. Uh, placeholder... On zone admin. That should be a relatively easy fix, but I just want to make sure I don't forget about it. Uh, okay. So let me think about these use cases here. So uh, I have a list of questions. I want to. So I could just make it so whenever I add a question, it always appends it to the end. 
All right, that would be easy enough. Just give me the give me the largest number and then add one and, and make that question. So I would create a new question. I wouldn't have to enter order number nine here. It would just you know figure it out that I want I want to add nine. That one is that one's less of an issue for me. The other the tougher one is okay. I've got Couchbase Basics one two three and then I've got more questions. I want to add in a fourth Couchbase Basics. I want to add Couchbase Basics four. I want it to be fourth in the list, and I want to move everything else up. So how would I do that? You could use a sortable jQuery widget or similar. Save the sort order on submit. This only works well if all the items fit on screen. I th yeah, uh, there's no paging involved here for actions. Generally speaking, we're talking 20 to 30, 30 at the very most. I don't think we've even gotten that high. Yeah, jQuery widget, but then that's that's fine. Then I got to come up with an endpoint or something to actually do the sorting. Uh, let's see. So suppose I create a new action. Maybe by default, this is populated with the, the max order plus one, right? So this would be, nope, I mean the widget lets you drag and drop to sort. Right, right, it does, it does. But then I have to, you know, actually, actually store this number in the database. So I have to actually update that kind of stuff. So there has to be a back end to it as well. It's not just dropping in a widget and there we go. It has to be has to result in saving. So what I'm thinking is, okay, so right now I have eight questions, one through eight, create a new action. I'm thinking this automatically populates with nine. That's a helpful thing. Which reminds me, there's something else I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, import questions from past challenges. Something of meaning to do, because right now it's a copy and paste exercise. Not a big deal, but uh, something that would make the, make the tool more helpful to others who are running these events. Because I can't beat every one of these events, right? If we're going to run the challenge other events, I've got to be able to hand this over to other, other people. So, and then what I'm thinking is, okay, suppose I want to change that to four. Okay, it says, okay, the question you specified is four. Every other question that was that was four or higher previously gets incremented by one. Does that seem reasonable? And it's, it's still a little bit, you know, the drag and drop widget would kind of be nice, but um, let's... I want to start simple here first. Seems good. Is the sort order only stored client side then? Sort order only stored client side. Um, so if you go back here, look at one of these actions, you can see the order here is stored in the database. So that's that's number four. So it's stored in the in the database. And it's really, it's really more than just ordering. It's also kind of which question number it is. I don't remember why I designed it that way. But if you go up here to here and I say question two, see, it has the slash two at the end. It's telling me, give me the second question in this zone. Now what I probably could do instead, I don't know if I, if this is a, I could say instead of specifying the sort order number up here, I could say just give me the action ID, right? Because each action has an ID as well, right here. It's gonna be a long URL though. It's gonna be at like action, you know, GUID. This is gonna be the URL, which I mean, it's not terrible, but that's what it's gonna look like. And that might be the more correct way to do it. That would fix my sort order, like numbering bug. Oh, well, look at that. that. That might be an easy fix here to do. Uh, it would fix one of my problems. Demo of the functionality I'm thinking of is, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I've, I've, seen, I've seen those before. I've seen those sortable 
Here, we'll just bring it up here. Yeah, these sortable sort of plugins. And uh, jQuery is my love language, by the way. <laughs> speaking of speaking of love languages, I know it's kind of out of fashion these days uh, in, in favor of stuff like React and uh, Angular and whatnot, but uh, jQuery is my jam. I've, I've done a lot of jQuery in my time. I still remember the very day that uh, jQuery, I saw jQuery in a tech presentation that very day. Uh, that was one of those life-changing days because before then, this was a long time ago, but before I knew about jQuery, it was all just native, you know, plain old JavaScript and all the, at the time, you know, before every, every web browser was Chromium, at the time, Internet Explorer, Firefox, this was pre-Chrome, um, I don't know, was Netscape maybe still around back then? Um, all those different browsers would implement the DOM differently, have little different quirks and things. And jQuery was like, oh, we'll, we'll abstract over all of those. And I was like, oh, this is terrific. This is amazing. It changed my life. But yes, jQuery, jQuery is my jam for sure. Actually, jQuery is in my bio. Whenever I send it out, send it out to events to speak at, I always mention jQuery. Because I just, I just love it. The only reason everyone is saying how unnecessary jQuery is today is that browsers were almost forced to fix their DOMs because of jQuery. I think that's, I think that's fair. But I think beyond that, I think jQuery does, you know, have a lot of really helpful features, and um, you know, the, the way it works with selectors and uh, events, things like that. It's just, it's just really nice to work with. And of course, plugins like this. So, you know, I know it's falling out of fashion, but there's probably still, you know, there's still a lot of jQuery out there, I'm assuming. A lot of people still working on jQuery. Love me some jQuery. All right, anywho. Uh, so I want to go to my, uh, this will be my admin controller. Which I don't know if I even have a test for any of these. Oh, wait, these are the tests. <laughs> Dope. Uh, admin controller. So under zone? No. Yes? Where is this? Yeah, zone slash zone ID. Admin, admin zone. Oh, no, no, we're not an admin. Oh, no. We're in the front end. I don't know what I'm thinking. Zone controller. So zone, zone ID. And see, I have current action number. And I don't know why I'd do that instead of just getting the action ID itself. Um, how does, how do I actually show that? Let's see. Current action number. So what is, gets zone view, what does this do? Gets the zone, it's completed points for the zone, gets the zone view. Uh, all right, and then it's, uh, should actually be hitting if, okay. And then gets the actions by zone for user. Orders them by the order. That's fine. That's all well and good. Zone view action. It's the order. Uh, do I actually, actually, I have the ID there. So why wouldn't I just use that instead? So let's go to the view zone index. action link. So I've got this current action number thing here. Yeah. So why wouldn't I just say action ID equals action dot ID? What would be the problem with that? And that is the um, for here just say string action ID equals null. Well, by default it is null, right? And so I've got this current action number. We'll have to change this, but this will be public string current action ID. I'll comment out this part. Current action is the first where ID equals current action ID. Um, 
that's, that probably will throw no roughness exception there if I haven't selected one yet. We'll come to that. Okay, so we can comment this part out. Zone view dot current action ID equals action ID. Maybe I change this to say current action ID. Ah. Resharper getting a little ambitious. Current action ID. I don't, I don't, it feels like I need to do more than that. All right, zone view does not contain a definition for current action ID. Okay. If model dot current action ID has value, which that's, that's going to be incorrect. This should be if, uh, if it is the case that string dot is null or empty model current action ID. Why is this? Oh, because that's not how you comment in Razor. There you go. So if, if it is not, does not have a value, I'm saying the same thing here. If this does not have a value, then show this, okay? Otherwise, show the current question. All right. This is probably going to break some tests. Oh, I see the follow here. Appreciate that follow. I'll follow you back. Oh, no, you're, you're at dinner right now, so you're not hearing this. I just got distracted by Twitter. Okay, do I have to rerun this app? What are we doing here? So now you can see here. Oh. Okay, doesn't like that one because I didn't change it. There we go. Got to change the route as well. Developers week. So this is the default page. If I go here, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not liking it. Why is that? I'll debug here. We'll step through it. Developers week. Yep, fine. Okay, I want to go here. Current action ID is null. Why is that? Oh, I was saying action ID. Uh, I think that's the problem. I've mixed up my, my terms here. Yeah, this should be. Well, why is this? Uh, do I have to specify null there? Okay, I don't know about that. I'm getting rid of that. This should be current action ID, I believe. Current action ID. Okay, developer week and okay. So I've got that fixed. So that that's no longer a problem, right? So if I go to uh, zones here and actions, and let's say we have a duplicate order number, right? So now I have two number fours, right? So this is another question. This is question again. So I fixed that issue. Of course, now which order these are in is kind of non-deterministic, I guess. So those could switch orders. That would be kind of annoying. But I got, I got one thing fixed. Now we got this massive URL, which is not the end of the world. Some people get, uh, you know, get bothered by URLs like this. Uh, me included, I guess, but um, it'll be fine for now. This is because I've chosen to use GUIDs for my document keys. Okay, so that's one thing fixed, I believe. Uh, so let's run the unit tests. This is something that I should have unit tests for. So hopefully this breaks some unit tests. We'll find out.
Okay, no unit test broken, which is not good. Yep, GUIs don't look pretty, but they do make it almost impossible to guess IDs for other records. Yeah, that's that's true. I, I, not not a major problem for this particular application, but um, it's just you know I, I could have used some other random identifier like a shorter one, but yeah, GUID GUID it is. Okay, so uh, the problem here is I'll clean this up a little bit. Um, Zone controller test. So what have I got here? Fill in the blank, matching. What did I, I what did I actually change? That should have broken my tests. I changed the zone controller. Uh, the index method of the zone controller, I think, is what I changed. I may not have a test for that. Yeah, I don't have a test for that. At this point, I should probably break this up into multiple uh, unit test files, but we're going to not do that for now. Maybe in the future, we'll put that in the backlog. Uh, split out unit tests into files that correspond to actions. Split out controller unit tests. This is what I used to do as well. Each, each controller or each action would have its own unit test um, class. Instead of, uh, I guess these are probably all the same, but anyway. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to zone controller. We're testing the index here. So the index, okay. Um, if, uh, yeah, see, this is making it difficult to name this unit test, but uh, index should default to first action if no action specified. Okay, and so we've got a controller, so we'll do the arrange, act, and assert. This is a good framework to think about when you're writing unit tests. I like to be explicit about it and maybe even add additional notes. But those are the three parts of any good unit test, range, act, assert, A, A, A. So we want to, um, we're going to act controller.index and we're going to give it you know, some, some zone ID. I don't think it matters. And we're, not, we're going to give it null for that, which is optional, I think. Make it optional? No, it's not optional. So we'll pass it, it doesn't matter because it's a string, it's nullable. So we'll pass in null there and the result. And we want to make sure that the, the result um, um, is this asynchronous? No, it's not. So view result is what we want. result as view results because this way I can now get access to the model which is what I want to run my assertions against Whoop. so we want to assert uh, that whatever this zone view returns is going to uh, well basically assert that view result dot uh, model, right? What is view results on model returning? Object. I have to cast that too. Equals view results dot model as um, zone view. So then we can say model dot current action ID is null. Okay. And I have to do, to do any other setup, I think, maybe. <clears throat> Ensure user is created. Uh, we can ignore that part. 
user has access to the zone. Yep, user has access, unless otherwise indicated. So I got that set up, so that, that should pass that. Get the zone view, which I don't care what the zone view is. So let's see if this works. Look at all these unit tests. Okay, so we've got a null reference because, probably because this isn't returning anything. So we need to set up get zone view to return something. That would be the arrange part. Um, mock zone service dot. Oh, let's see. Here's a question. If an exception is thrown in the test, does the test automatically fail, or do you need to handle exceptions? Uh, an exception, unhandled exception in a test, will cause the test to fail. That is correct. Uh, if you if you want to test to make sure that an exception happens, you want that's something you might have to do sometimes. Uh, different frameworks handle that differently. So I believe, uh, obviously the easiest way is to just throw the whole thing inside a try catch. But I think there's an attribute where it's like ex like expected exception, something like that. I don't remember. I don't know if that's any unit or not. But yes, uh, any, any exception will cause the test to fail. Yep, <clears throat> which you just saw, actually. Uh, it was what happened over here, no reference exception. So it's not not really how we want tests to fail, but uh, you know that's uh, that will cause them to fail. So we want to set up uh, the mock to return something, something not a null. Get zone view. M dot get zone view of it doesn't matter. It is any string. I don't care. It is any string because I don't care about this part. Returns and again I don't really care. What it returns just a new zone view as long as it's not null i think is all i really care about okay passing passing test okay probably clean this up here get rid of that okay and the other thing i want to test is if the current action is set really the same thing Um, oh, kind of the same thing. So I'll just copy this. Index should show selected action. Okay, and so in this case, it'll be some... Yeah, we'll, we'll set up an expected action ID equals some action ID doesn't matter. We're not actually hitting a database, right? So as, as long as it's a string, and we want this to be equal to that. I could probably turn these into a uh, parameterized test instead of duplicating most of this code. Okay. Um, well, I'm not really testing that this is a default action, though. I'm testing that the current action is null. So really what I want is zone view. Oh, um, hmm. let me think about this. So this is returning a zone view. I think this is working because I've seen it working, but I want to, whoops. Oh, I think that might be in my zone view action. No. Might be some logic in my zone view. Yep. There it is. So this is the why I should be testing right here. So that's a separate test. It's a zone view test, All right? Do I have any zone view tests? I do have a zone view test. Okay. All right. So uh, these tests are all passing too. Action should not be hidden. If okay, those are hidden dates. We don't, I don't use those very much. Action should not be visible. So I don't have any. You know, what would help here is if I turned on live unit testing. I could see the coverage.
Looks like I got some failing tests. But what I want to do is I want those. Yeah, there we go. That's what I want. And then I can see in here. Yeah, see, this is not tested. I have no test on that. Not that it's a major piece of code to test, but I just want to. Um, uh, let's see. A first action should be selected if no action specified. Selected is the right word? Should be current. If no action specified. Right. I don't have my arraigned act assert uh, set these tests. These are relatively simple. That's probably why. Zone view. Zone view dot actions. Equals a new list of zone view actions. And so I can just start adding actions to that. Okay. Um, this is actually more complicated than the code I'm testing. <laughs> which happens sometimes, okay. Um, order equals, let's just make that out of order. Uh, ID equals GUID.new GUID, two string. And we'll do the same thing here, but this will be out of order. Okay, act should be uh, um, current equals zone view dot current action, I'm going to assert that current.id equals, okay, so this is where I want to, I want to break these up, uh, expected action equals like so, just to have that separate outside the list. Okay, current ID is equal to expected action dot ID. And it fails. Why is that? Actions. Well, let's we'll just uh, step through it here. Love me the ReSharper test runner. My favorite things about ReSharper. Oh, what's happening? Okay. Actions has two of them. Okay. I want to see where the first one, ID, equals current action ID. Oh, current action ID is set to null. Do you completely decouple the tests from your database, or do you have some tests use an in-memory database and some to test the live database? Really good question. So uh, I don't know if you were here earlier when I was showing this, but I do have in this project this whole idea of integration tests. And in my mind, integration tests hit the actual database. So I just have one that does that um, right here. This is to test a... Uh, the, the certain challenge questions actually involve writing SQL. And uh, what I actually do is I actually execute that SQL against the database to see if it returns the result that the, the quiz answer uh, matches. Bada bing, bada boom. Zanark Alucard. Thank you for the follow. That is Dracula Kranaz backwards. <laughs> Anywho, uh, so this is an integration test. This actually hits the database. For the most part, my unit tests, when I say unit tests, that means they do not hit the database. They completely mock out the database. I don't hit even an in-memory version. I just completely mock out the database. Um, so an in-memory database, um, this is a, a, a technique I've seen in the past. It's kind of a pseudo-integration test in my mind because you're going to hit a... A, uh, you're going to hit a database, but it's it's like not the same database you're actually going to hit in production, right, or in integration. So just as an example, a uh, project I worked on a long time ago, um, it was you use SQL Server as a backend, and the unit tests, well, some of the integration tests anyway, they used an in-memory SQLite to run the tests against. 
And this is, you know, an approach I've seen before. I'm not saying this is the wrong approach, but um, in my experience, that is fine, but SQLite and SQL Server are not the same thing. So if we're, if in some cases there are tests and situations and queries and, and things that work differently in SQLite than they do in SQL Server. The syntax is different in many cases. Uh, so sometimes you can abstract that away with Entity Framework or um, Dapper or whatever. No, not, not so much Dapper. But, you know, this, that just introduces, in my mind, again, in my mind, some, some room for there to be uh, unexpected things to happen in production that you didn't catch with those tests in development. So generally speaking, I have avoided doing, taking that approach having an in-memory version to test the live database, which uh, isn't to say, you know, I get asked about this from time to time, like how could I do this with Couchbase? Um, and they're really, and so like there's Couchbase Lite that exists for mobile databases, but that's really very different than Couchbase Server, very, very different. Um, so you couldn't do, you couldn't really do the same thing with unit tests. Now there is uh, a project out there called Couchbase Mock, which is a Java project, but it can be used by anybody because it's a separate process that basically pretends to be Couchbase Server, like a much lower footprint version of it. It can parse um, SQL queries even to some extent and act as if it were a real Couchbase Server. And so some people use that project to, you know, for unit testing purposes to, to mock out Couchbase, but not, not mocking the C-sharp interface to Couchbase, but by mocking Couchbase itself. So you're connecting, you're still connecting to a separate process. So uh, I guess the answer to your question is, uh, it depends. But in, in this project, I completely decouple, for the most part, from the database. And when I do connect to the database with my tests, I connect to the actual real database, uh, which I don't do very much, but uh, I, I do. Thanks for the in-depth answer. I'm trying not to distract you too much from your work, but I have lots of TDD questions. Trying to get into better coding habits. Have coded for many years without automated tests. Doug the Coder, this is a safe place for you to ask questions and do not worry about distracting me at all. I mean, that's the whole reason I do this stream is to interact with people and and uh, that's a great question. So thank you for uh, for that. Uh, I am no by no means a TDD expert, but I have written a lot of unit tests in my in my time. Not so much in the last four years, but before that, I worked at a company where we were very, very strict about unit tests. Like everything have to ha has to have a unit test. It doesn't necessarily have to be TDD. But TDD was encouraged and uh, you know, definitely uh, something you could do. But uh, the whole thing was they had to go to code review. If you don't have unit tests in place, then you got to go back and have a unit test. So we did a lot of unit testing, a lot of end units. A lot of these conversations we had uh, while I was working there. It was a short period of time, but I really did a lot of that. And the job before that was same, not quite as strict, the unit tests, but I was, I was very strict about unit tests before then. So, um, yeah, this is a, these are great conversations for you to have with yourself and with your team. Uh, and so right now I'm trying to figure out... Um, so if you dot current action ID equals expected action ID. So this should make the test pass. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of code for one line of code being tested here, but that green check mark here that shows that this is working. Um, which leads me to actually, why is this, why isn't this throwing an exception when there is no current action ID? Current action it was null, all right? Let me just let me just try this in the browser. This should be throwing an exception. I would expect it to. When I go to here and there is no question. Oh, uh, is it because I handled that situation elsewhere? Um is it because I handle it in the view, unfortunately? That would be kind of lame. Uh, let's see, index. Yeah, I do handle it here. Okay. Yeah, I remember, I remember this. Okay. So I do handle it in the view. Uh, 
Uh, eh, that's fine. All right. Now, what was I? What was I doing here? Just test, right? I think it might be time for another commit. Let me see if I have any junk left over here. Yeah, so this should probably be a separate file, but let's leave it for now. Zone view tests. This is the test I just added. Zone controller. So we're changing this from current action number to current action ID, which really should have been in the first place. I'm not sure why I made that decision. And zone view needs to be updated because we don't need to leave that comment thing in there. Yeah. Uh, got quit. Yeah. Don't need saving notifications. Okay. All right. So that's what I changed there. And it's index. We've changed it to use current action ID instead of action number. Looks good to me. Switch to using action ID instead of order number for action selection, I guess. Okay, so that fixes one problem. Uh, still doesn't fix my sorting issue. If we go over here to zones. <laughs> oh, I gotta re rerun this thing. We go over here to admin zones and actions. If I create a new action, I want to avoid the situation where I have duplicate numbers, right? So let's uh, change this one back to five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Okay. So why don't I start by? Hmm. Let me think about this. Let's go to zones. Let's create a new zone. Test zone. This will expire yesterday. Well, no. We'll expire it two weeks from now. Test zone ordering. 11.30. So around noon is when I will shut us down. So we'll get as far as we can in half an hour. Um, let me see what else I have on my calendar for today. Okay. Yep, so we'll go till noon. Maybe a little farther. We'll see how long we get here. Uh, public zone. Yeah, I don't care about that. All right. So right now we start with blank slate. No actions. So I have a create a new action. What I want to show up here is I want a number one to show up here. Okay. So we'll close all this. We're going to... Uh, in, the, in the UI here, we have under admin and action admin... And we're going to add or edit. Wait. Yeah, it's a post. All right. This is this is the uh, method that we're hitting right now. I think that's correct. No test around this. You can see that all those minuses equals no tests. Yep, so that's the end, that's the endpoint, the action. I keep saying endpoint and action. Really kind of the same thing. Uh, so that's the one we're hitting. So it might be time for a new unit test file. Uh, tests, admin, controller. So I'm going to start by making this um, action admin controller test. Start by making this separated. And we're going to say uh, add action to zone tests. So these are these are tests only for the add action to zone methods. Okay, and we'll call this test fixture and unit for live. Set up. Okay, and um, I want to write a test. And uh, um, 
when adding a a new action, the form should be populated with the zone ID. The form should be pre-populated, pre-populated with zone ID. Range act assert. It probably would be helpful if I create like a little snippet to do this, to do all that sort of templating and just I have to just type in the name. That'd probably be a helpful thing to do. All right, so we're going to arrange this and uh, we're always going to need the controller here. So controller equals new action admin controller. And what am I missing here? I'm missing admin service. So I want to mock admin service object. Equals new mock of I, uh, was it I admin service? Uh -huh. I'm using MOQ as my test framework. I love me some MOQ. I really love me some just mock. I haven't done this in a while. Maybe I should go back and try this. But I had problems with using just mock with uh, .NET core, .NET standard, whatever you want to call it, .NET standard 2. So I switched back to MOQ. Seems to be working fine. So this is this could be a user error on my part. But uh, just, just mock right here from progress, which used to be Telerik, is a mocking library that I like very much. So if you're, inter if you're looking for a good mocking library, check out just mock. It might work fine with .NET standard, .NET core. I just haven't gotten it to work yet myself. But I just really like the mocking syntax for it. You don't have to worry about this dot object thing on these mock objects, which is a small thing, I admit, but okay. All right, so uh, I don't really care about mock admin service. I just need it for the controller. We'll probably use it later. So we're going to arrange. Um, so expected zone ID equals, you know, whatever zone ID, Yahoo. I'm going to act, this will be controller dot, what is it, uh, add action to zone, expected zone ID. And I want to assert that we're going to get that um, default form. So default form, well, let's say form equals result dot as view result dot model as, uh, what is the type? Um, add action edit form. So this is the default form. When, you, when I first go uh, to, where is it? Uh, I guess I closed it already. When you first go to add a new action, this will be the default form that it will it will pass to the view. It'll basically be mostly empty, except I do want to uh, have the uh, zone ID in there is equal to expected zone ID. So this is just testing what I I know kind of already works. Hence the green checkboxes. When doing when doing TDD, typically you want to have failing tests first. You want to have red, and then you want to see that the code you've written. Make it makes it green. That just gives you a little more confidence in the process. That's the whole idea with TDD. I'm sort of not doing that in this case, um, but I think it's probably okay. I'm not going to stress out over it. Okay, um, public void when adding. This is going to be new functionality now, so this will be red to start with. Adding new action. The form should be pre-populated with. Um, with um, uh, greatest, with like uh, greatest order number plus one. If that uh, if that makes sense, is there a more concise way of writing that? Uh, no action. So um, yeah, I think that's probably fine. So when adding a new action, it should be pre-populated with a new order number. Yeah, okay, I think that's good. Range, act, assert. 
So uh, we'll say fair expected zone ID. No, I'm not expecting that. So I'll just say zone ID. It doesn't matter. So I'll say Doug the coder, not dog the coder. Dog the coder ID one, two, three. And we're going to uh, do something very similar here. Add action to zone. Zone ID. Dog the bounty coder. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking something like that. And we're going to get the form back out again. But this time, oh, we do need to set up that, because um, we are going to have to actually now use the admin service now, I believe. My admin service. This is going to get existing zone. So one of these probably already returns the information I need. Get existing action, get existing zone. Get existing admin. So I want to, yeah, I could write a separate query to do this. Um, just give me the largest order number in the, in the zone that I'm currently in. But I think one of these methods already kind of queries everything I need. I don't want to rewrite everything, especially for a backend use case where optimization isn't going to really gain me a lot. We're talking two or three people at most using this at the same time. And that would be an extremely rare situation. Uh, so get existing action, get existing zone. This only seems to return the root level information about the zone. Get action admin index view. Yeah, this should work. So I'm going to set up M to get action admin view, and this will just be zone ID, uh, and it's going to return um, an admin action view, action admin index view. Okay, so what I expect that to be is this new action admin index view. Fine. Oh, here's a question. Does Couchbase have the concept of a trigger? That would probably be how I'd implement that in SQL Server. Hmm, interesting. So Couchbase doesn't have triggers per se, um, because everything in Couchbase is kind of memory first and works on something like an event bus. Uh, protocol called DCP. So what we what Couchbase does have in the enterprise version is something called eventing. Uh, and so eventing would then, <clears throat> you know, you'd write some some JavaScript code. So when a object is changed or added or deleted, that event would execute. So yes, we could do that with eventing. Um, I think that would work actually. So whenever an action is saved. We would just query and get the max number. The, I guess my concern would be, well, for one, I'd have to add a venting service to Couchbase cluster. And my Couchbase cluster is right now is just a single node, which is not recommended for production. Um, so adding the venting service would just be an additional uh, bit of overhead. For just this one thing, probably not worth it. But yes, absolutely, we could do that. So um, I think that would work. So yeah, good, good, um, good suggestion. Don't spend money for this. I don't think I'd have to spend any more money. On so I'm currently hosting this in Azure, and that's another nice thing that we get as MVPs is we get some free Azure credit every month. Um, so I, I'm, if I add eventing, I may have to bump up the VM a little bit. So it would technically be spending a little more money, unless I already have eventing on there. I might, but I don't have any events to play. I know that for sure. Um, but I don't think, you know, I think it's a good thought. It's a very good thought and uh, something you de could definitely do. So yes, but I'm, I'm not going to do that for this, uh, this, this uh, particular sample. Um, but hypothetically, we could we could fix this ordering thing with without writing any more C sharp code. We could just put it in our database in a, in a Couchbase event. So yes, 
Uh, but uh, another issue there is venting is, is uh, enterprise only. And so if I eventually shared this as an open source project, which I plan to eventually, we'd have to, you'd have to use enterprise version, which requires a license for production. So uh, this, that would also, as it stands right now, require you to have a license to, to deploy this. So I'm thinking very, very long term, uh, I want to keep uh, this to be kind of community focused if possible. And venting would, would, uh, would cancel it out. Although I, I will say I'm using analytics in here as well. Couchbase analytics is also currently enterprise only. However, um, only for certain types of challenge questions. So you could just, you know, you only get those questions types if you use the enterprise version of Couchbase. So, um, anywho, that's a whole separate thing. But a really good idea, Doug. So thank you. Uh, and a good question. All right. So uh, action admin index view dot actions. We're going to have new list of actions. What am I testing here again? Order numbers. So right now, I'll just start with... Uh, it's going to be zero actions in there, right? And so we'll assert that form dot order is equal to one. Okay, and that should fail. Yep, and it does. That's what I expect it to do because there are no actions in there. Well, because I haven't written any code for it yet, basically. Okay, so right here, when we're adding a new action, I want to uh, uh, set the default order as the highest order number plus one. So we can get all the actions here by saying, uh, uh, let's see, zone equals admin service dot get. And the method I'm using is, what was it? Get action admin index view. And just pass in the zone ID. We already have those. That's good. And highest order number equals zone dot actions dot order by order ID. Oh, a dot order ID. Order by descending. Um, let's just do this. Zone dot actions dot order by descending dot uh, select ah everything's covering up a dot order and then um, first or default so that should return a number um, default number will be zero and then we'll say um, Default form dot order equals highest order number plus one. Okay, we've got some passing, some failing. So this test is now passing. This test is now failing. Why is that? Because I don't set up. Uh, well, I do have actions here. There's zero actions, right? It's an empty list. So this will uh, return. It's not going to be null reference because I'm selecting an order, which is an integer. And default of integer is zero. It's not null, it's zero. So that would be fine. But the problem is um, my other test is failing because I've introduced this get action admin index view here, and I haven't mocked that up properly. So it's just, uh, it's just it's a null reference exception, I assume. All right, so I just need to arrange that. And uh, set up m to m dot get action admin index view uh, doesn't matter it dot is any integer and returns new action admin index view. Oh, right. What, what happened there? Uh, action admin index view. What was it supposed to return? User admin index view? What? Oh, that's the wrong one. Action admin index view. And this should be is any string. 
Okay, so now it should pass. Maybe? No? Still null because zone actions is null. Yep, so and again, I just have to say, this would be a, just a new empty list. Now it should pass. There we go, okay. So this is kind of annoying to have to put in here, um, be, but it's because I've just added more complexity to this controller. Um, I may, I may want to, I could probably refactor this since that's the, that's the cycle, right? Red, green, refactor. Um, notice these aren't hit because zone not actions is always empty. So I may have to run a test for that too. Um, We could just inside, we could refactor this to a method inside um, the admin service. Default form that order equals get next order number uh, from the zone ID. This would go in here. Create method. Oh, no, not there. Uh, this would be in the admin service. That's always going to return an integer, not nullable. So inside here, we we'll just go like this and return plus one. Still going to pass? What don't you like about that? Because it's a mock now. <laughs> okay, so my all my testing code should go out of the controller and now into admin service. Oh gosh, okay. Admin service test. Create a class here, get next order number, get next order number tests. Yeah, that's fine. So there's not going to be much left to test in my controller. Okay, uh, what else we got here? We've got... Oh yeah, I can just use this. I got a base class for this. Maybe? Oh, what's happening? Oh no. What did I paste? Ah! Cancel. Admin service. Yeah, that's what I want. Okay. And... Uh, so this will be over here. Uh, the name of the, yeah. The next order number should return. Uh, highest order number plus one. And... Take that comment out. So really, this is kind of a this is kind of it becomes a worthless test here. But I should move it over to here, All right? Uh, basically. I think about this. So I had mocked this out before. I'm gonna mock out itself. That would be weird. That's probably a reason not to have this in this admin service. Because everything else just goes to user repository. Uh, this one actually calls back on itself. Just kind of a helper function. Hmm, okay, well, I don't know. I think I'm thinking about that some more. Um, this might be the wrong place for this kind of helper function, just based on what the tests are telling me. But I'm not sure about that. So anyway, 
I think I'm going to call it a day for now. It's uh, lunchtime, and uh, maybe the microphone picked up on my uh, stomach rumbling a little bit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look for someone else to raid on my team. Who else is out there, and what are they doing? If you have any suggestions, I'd like to hear it. C Sharp Fritz, I just raided him last week. Oh, one more thing from Doug Decoder. Just before you sign off, I saw a life-changing two-hour refractoring workshop on YouTube with Woody Zuiel and Llewellyn Falco. But of course, refactoring like this is only safe if all your key functionality has good test coverage. So check out that link there uh, if you can read it on the video. Uh, it's a YouTube link with Woody Zuiel. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And Llewellyn Falco. And uh, let's bring it up on the screen here. We're not going to watch it. But uh, there it is, two minutes to better code. It actually is two hours to better code. Practical refactoring with Woody Zawiel and Llewellyn Falco. So there you go, check it out. This one is pretty old. But the thing about you know, unit testing is that a lot of the principles uh, you know, don't change with the technologies. Um, so how to clean code in many small steps. Okay, cool, cool recommendation. Thank you very much, Doug, appreciate that. All right. So not C sharp for us. Rated him last time. We got a web dev stream here with. If you're learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, this can be a. Jim Jim S Werner. Don't know how to pronounce that. Code rushed. Zeratar. Any suggestions for who to raid next? I'm open. Brian Lagunas is going to be starting soon, doing an update of a plural site course. That's cool. Um, don't know how long it's going to be until he starts. Uh, but we could go over there. Mr. Demon Wolf. Uh, MongoDB, so we're not going to raid Mr. Demon Wolf. Sorry, Demon Wolf. Uh, this is one I've not raided before. So why don't we check out this one. This will be JMSWRNR. We'll start the raid on that one. If you are a subscriber, make sure to copy and paste Calvin's head. Bada bing, bada boom. It's a raid. Here it is. You can copy and paste that. Be nice. I will see you over there. Thank you for joining me today. I'll be back Thursday afternoon, 1.30 p.m. That's Eastern U.S. time. And we'll probably pick up where we left off and keep working on this. But thank you for joining me. We'll see you over there. Everybody have a good one. So what we need to do... What? Matthew!